Special thanks to the American Shakespeare Center in Stanton, Virginia. The ASC's 2020 production of A Christmas Carol is an ensemble-driven, music-infused retelling of the beloved tale of redemption. Streaming tickets available now at AmericanShakespeareCenter.com. The Beethoven Experience series on Rubato, the Heifetz Virtual Concert Hall, is generously supported by Chris and Betsy Little. Hello, I'm Nicholas Kitchen. I'm Artistic Director of the Heifetz International Music Institute. I'm also first violinist of the Borromeo String Quartet, and the Borromeo Quartet is the quartet in residence for the Heifetz Institute. I'm very, very happy to welcome you tonight uh, to a program which uh, is a bit of a transposition of things that we were planning to do in the spring. Uh, we were uh, giving, going to give three concerts during this spring um, called the Beethoven Experience. And the one in particular for tonight uh, was called Speaking to God uh, because uh, the third movement of the piece that you're going to hear tonight really has a uh, place in Beethoven's own work and in the string quartet literature in general, which is really like no other. But we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, Let's get straight to the music here. This is going to be uh, the String Quartet Opus 132. Uh, in the first concert, you heard Opus 18, number one, and Opus 59, number one. In the second concert, we explored Opus 127. Uh, in last week's offering, we explored Opus 18, number two, and Opus 59, number two, the Razumovsky Second String Quartet. And now here we are at Opus 132. Um, well, let me just lay out a few things about the music. Uh, it's going to be in five movements, and that number five does play into a lot of what you're going to perceive tonight, and in some important and very wonderful ways. Uh, the piece starts with something that says, very sustained, and I'll just play the pitches that you're going to hear. You're going to hear the cello play this. going to elaborate about the musical mechanisms exactly, but uh, you can, I think, instinctively feel how those pairs of pitches are going to run through everything that you're going to hear in this 50 minutes of music. Um, the one place that is going to change noticeably is in the enormous third movement. And remember that we had the five movements, so let me just say what they are. It starts with that mysterious set of four notes. Then those four notes remain, but a much faster allegro starts happening above the same four notes. And that, this wonderful and varied uh, set of musical expressions makes up this marvelous first movement of this piece. Then we go into a second movement which uh, has, uh, you know, is like a scherzo. It has a, a lighter character. It actually takes certain figures and almost like a, a kaleidoscope, it just turns those figures in every possible way. Uh, one could say that it's being a little repetitive, but I think what's actually amazing is that Beethoven continues to shade those changes in a way that is ever fascinating. Um, then that brings us to the third movement, and I'm not going to say anything about that at the moment. I'm just going to go ahead to the fourth and fifth movements uh, and then come back to the third. Uh, the fourth movement, after the incredible quiet and, and grandeur of the third movement, is uh, one of those cases where Beethoven becomes a little bit silly. And uh, he did have a great sense of humor and uh, loved puns much too much. And uh, uh, this is a march, and it's a march that will just kind of leap out as if it's loud, and then it'll come back and be soft, and it's very, very playful, and just uh, uh, full of all kinds of pranks, as it were. Uh, then you'll hear the first violin go into some cadenzas, which are making a transition into something. We don't quite know what yet. 
And then we'll have the last movement, which is basically a fast movement with the words appassionato in the tempo marking. And uh, there, those pitches that I played on the piano are going to come back. They're going to dominate, but he's going to do totally different things with them. And uh, by the time we finish this movement, it just has this just absolutely triumphant and um, galloping kind of feeling, like it's flying through the last section of music. It's a presto, and you'll hear the cello incredibly high, and all this playing around with staccato strokes, and Beethoven did all kinds of, he had us play at the frog and at the tip. And by the way, Beethoven, even though he couldn't hear a thing when he was rehearsing with this Schupanzig Quartet, he apparently would grab the violin and demonstrate these special staccato strokes, even though he could have no idea what pitches he was playing. Um, well, that's how it ends. It has this just joyous ending. Um, and so we remember, we've had the mysterious first movement that becomes very grand. We have the kind of kaleidoscopic second movement. We have the almost joking fourth movement. And then this appassionato, but eventually kind of soaring uh, last moment. So those are the, you know, parts one, two, four, and five. Well, let's get back to part number three. Um, this has a very, very special title where um, Beethoven says, this is the song of thanks to the divinity from one who has recovered. And... Um, Beethoven, at this time in his life, I, I heard a wonderful story where he was given a book by Breitkopf and Hertel of ancient music. And they asked him to review it, meaning that he should do it quickly and return it. Um, some years after that book was given to him, it was one of the books that was in his house when he died. He went deeply into the history of music. Um, he had assistance from people like uh, Mr. Kana who was a great expert in religious music. Uh, and these were the things that fueled the just magnificent complexity of the Misa Solemnis. Well, all of that investigation wasn't somehow lost on the way this quartet, Opus 132, is constructed. Um, that reference to being recovered could very easily be from Beethoven's life. He was dealing with some very daunting illnesses. Uh, and close to death himself, and that sense of recovery may be just a direct and personal um, response to what happened in his life. It is kind of interesting that Opus 132 was also the piece that he collaborated with the Schupanzig Quartet just after Opus 127. And Opus 127 uh, really was a piece that ran the danger of uh, destroying his relationship with Schupanzig, who had been his collaborator in writing every single string quartet. Um, maybe there's something of that in this reference to recovery. Perhaps. Maybe it's also just something much more universal. Now, we talked about the five different movements. Well, it happens that that five-part structure is crucial to this Song of Thanks, which is the centerpiece of Opus 132. Beethoven references a, a modal history, and he puts it in the title also. He says this is going to be in the Lydian mode, and the Lydian mode is connected with healing. Uh, well, uh, just to, you can hear a little bit what the Lydian mode is. If I had a typical F major scale, it would be... So you kind of have these, and then a smaller interval, and then it finally ends with another one of those smaller intervals. Well, listen to what a Lydian mode sounds like. It's still on the same pitch center. I think you can feel that it's almost like something opens up in the way that scale sounds. Well, this is the mode on which he constructed the movement. And what you'll hear at the beginning is you will hear the quartet do a kind of a dialogue, and then they will play together a hymn. Now, they will do this pairing five times. Dialogue, hymn, dialogue, hymn, dialogue, hymn, dialogue, hymn, dialogue, hymn. Five pairs. 
Uh, then, out of that last hymn, the music will just turn the corner and it says Andante and feeling new life. And this is a moment you'll hear the first violin soar out on this A, which has special marks, which just make it kind of glow with a, a, a glorious kind of intensity. Uh, and uh, the whole quartet sort of comes into action. And um, so we have the Adagio, then we have the Andante. Now what Beethoven is going to do is he's going to do that same pair again. So that makes four sections, hymns, feeling new life, hymns, feeling new life. It happens that these hymns are going to match exactly the first set, but they will be more elaborate. Uh, it happens that the next andante is going to match the first andante, but it also is going to be more elaborate. And then finally, the fifth section. So I think you've seen me lay this out. We have the slow section, the andante, the slow section, the andante. And finally, we return to the slow section. But here he's done this wonderful thing of taking the music of the dialogue and the music of the hymn, and now he's joined them. And so now they happen at the same time, and they reach, and they reach, and they reach, and they finally just really create music that, that could not be more immense in its impact. Uh, well, this is the Heilige Gedanke song. It's one of, I, I just can't think of any sort of soundscape in music that has this kind of unique quality. You just never forget what it feels like to hear this kind of character, this kind of purity, and yet somehow some kind of glowing intensity that fuels it uh, in a perhaps mysterious, but absolutely inspiring way. Uh, of course, our concerts that we were planning to do in the spring uh, were relocated to these summer explorations by events that everyone in the world has had to deal with. Um, this year is a year to celebrate Beethoven. Uh, I do think it's a very nice time to just contemplate what would it mean to be a person of the talent and the promise of Beethoven and come to face that the one sense that the, was the most crucial to you was going to be taken away from you? I think we would all understand if Beethoven wrote a number of brilliant pieces and then kind of got discouraged. But that is not what Beethoven did. In fact, when one looks at it and just contemplates the challenges that he was faced with, you realize that he actually accelerated into those challenges. And of course, with his incredible generosity, uh, he gave us peace after peace, new exploration after new exploration, and somehow tapped into his own spirit and in this case, spirituality, uh, to give us these gifts, which we know we will treasure in our hearts for as long as we live and as long as I hope all people live. Now, it happens that the Heile Gedanke song is, is really referring to the divinity. And it happens that that really meant a lot to Beethoven. Um, now, we were originally planning to have a discussion before the concert where we would go into that in some detail. Uh, that would be with myself and Benjamin Rowe and Ethan McSweeney and Paul Menzer. Uh, Ethan McSweeney from the American Shakespeare Center and Paul Menzer from the College of Visual and Performing Arts at Mary Baldwin University and Ben Rowe from the Heifetz Institute. Um, we're not going to do that, and I think I've spoken enough about the piece. I want you to hear it. But I do have with me two books that I happen to really, really love. Um, one of them is Lewis Lockwood's biography of Beethoven. I think you can see it's got a few notes in it. And um, there's no one who presents the richness of uh, the musical background with as much completeness, but also presents the multiple ways it can be seen, the true complexity 
of what it means for someone with the creative richness that Beethoven had to forge their path through life. It is just a wonderful book. And um, this one is also one that I've just treasured. It's by Maynard Solomon, and it's uh, late Beethoven. And uh, in this, it in fact has um, a whole set of chapters about the way the very important Masonic beliefs that were around in Beethoven's time worked their way into Beethoven's life. Um, what's more important than what the Masonic thread might be is that Beethoven himself had this strength of belief in the energies which surrounded and could be put into music. Uh, but these books give us a really marvelous point of view to start to appreciate the richness of how we can relate to that and how we can relate it perhaps to our own lives. Most importantly, this is absolutely unbelievable music you're about to listen to. Uh, you're going to hear it in a performance that our quartet gave um, at, uh, in um, Northeast Harbor in Maine uh, at the Mount Desert uh, Concerts of Chamber Music uh, led by Todd Crow. And, uh, well, we hope that you enjoy it.
Major support for the Beethoven Experience is provided by Chris and Betsy Little. Special thanks to the American Shakespeare Center in Stanton, Virginia. The ASC's 2020 production of A Christmas Carol is an ensemble-driven, music-infused retelling of the beloved tale of redemption. Streaming tickets available now at AmericanShakespeareCenter.com. The Heifetz Institute presents the Beethoven Experience Birthday Marathon. 
incisive discussions and gripping performances of all 16 of Beethoven's string quartets by the Borromeo Quartet, celebrating the 250th anniversary birthday of Beethoven by streaming live all day on December 16th on our Facebook page and the Violin Channel. Programs and schedule at heifetzinstitute.org. The 25th anniversary season of the Heifetz International Music Institute will take place from June 24th through August 7th, 2021. The immersive and transformative summer music experience will feature both in-person and virtual elements. Application and information at heifetzinstitute.org. Major support for the Heifetz International Music Institute is provided by Mary Baldwin University the National Endowment for the Arts, the Virginia Commission for the Arts, and the Community Foundation of the Central Blue Ridge. For a complete list of our supporters, sponsors, and in-kind donors, please visit heifetz.institute slash donors. We thank them and you for supporting our mission to enable the next generation of great artists to communicate, engage, inspire.